finest amongst my colleagues at the bar. You would have detected from the topic of the conversation that we are going to be talking about the Constitution, but not just how marvelous our Constitution is, but also what the limits are of the Constitution. Um, but, you know, as we um, look back to the making, we are 25 years on now since the making of the Constitution, and I think there are two things, and I'm hoping in the interplay and the conversation between the guests and, and the audience, we'll touch on these things. Two aspects of the Constitution. One is the process of making the Constitution. It's not unimportant. It's what makes a Constitution legitimate, what makes it acceptable to the public. And the second is the content of the Constitution. In other words, whether the content of the Constitution is just or not. Um, and when we look back to the making of the Constitution, we remember that that in itself was a decisive moment of confronting our past. Those of us who are old enough to remember, um, it was, this is not a very distant past, it was just the other day that we weren't able to move around freely in the country of our birth. With the adoption of the Constitution, uh, for the first time in centuries, the law of the land was clear, and the lodestars were freedom, equality, and dignity. The process of drafting and adopting the Constitution was also quite unique because it involved public participation, and it involved uh, a certification process uh, by the Constitutional Court. Just a word on the public participation aspect, which for me, um, is, is, was a very heartening part of it. And I was still very young and bright-eyed and believed in rainbowism and all sorts of funny things at that time. Uh, but, you know, what accompanied the process was a mass media campaign that was aimed at soliciting submissions and comments from members of the public about what should be contained in the Constitution. Um, and there were several ways in which the Constitutional Assembly and other bodies did this. And it was through media and radio and print. Um, and submissions were received, handwritten submissions that were retyped. Submissions were made in all languages and then translated. And uh, in the first three months, in fact, of this public participation process, uh, an overwhelming one million 753,424 submissions were received by ordinary members um, of the South African public. So, you know, our constitution making process was unique. There are also features of our constitution that set it apart from comparable constitutions, and particularly from those 18th century uh, Western liberal democracy constitutions. One feature is the inclusion of socioeconomic rights, the right to education, and health, and food, uh, and housing. Um, and, and for the first time, we we're able to hold the government to account for the failure to deliver on those rights, but also to demand that the government take steps in order to fulfill those rights. A second defining feature, and I'm not going to name them all, is the fact that in appropriate cases, the Bill of Rights binds private actors. Yet, despite this, we are living in a country in which we are seeing growing inequality. And so the objections and criticisms and challenges about whether our Constitution is actually taking us on the path that, that was set out, for example, in the preamble, whether that actually is working and where the problem lies, and whether the problem is the Constitution itself or something else. And so it's on that note that I'm going to <laughs> hand over and begin the conversation with our two panelists. Um, and I'm going to begin with a softball. Uh, but, but this is just the first question, uh, Judge Masaneke. Um, and that is, <coughs> to ask you about your reflections on, on the constitution making process. Well, <coughs> excuse me. It, 
let me thank the uh, Constitution Hill Trust. Thank you, Vanessa, the, the, obviously the, <clears throat> the trustees, and keeping alive a very important institution in our society. And thank all of you who are here. I'm sure you'll be thanked appropriately, but it remains significant that we, that we have space to talk about this difficult thing. I think you should tighten your seat belts. I don't think it's going to be an easy discussion. It was easy um, 25 years ago. I'll be, it's no longer easy. It's much more complicated. I teach at at least five law schools quite regularly. In the Western Cape, in Cape Town, in Venda, in the of Pretoria, at Wurz. Um, I taught at Fort Hare Online, University of the Free State, when I launched my book, and a lot of young people came. The discussion is no longer one to savor. It's gone complicated. So I don't want to go to the, and the complaint is that we have, including me, have overvalorized this constitution. In other words, we have repeated celebrations about how wonderful it is and what it has all done for us. Um, yes, for the middle class, yes. But there are difficult questions that arise. But let's go back to its formation. Part of this criticism is the Constitution was born in sin. No, people like Albi, people like my colleague here, Basil, and perhaps our President Ramaphosa and others would stand total aghast. But many young people assert that these were unequal forces that were driven essentially by guilt and wrong on the one side and um, right and idealism on the other. The process itself outwardly showed all the features of going to get us into another point. And I tell young people is being totally ahistorical to suggest that nothing happened in 1994. It is the sin that we must talk about. What is that? They say, well, essentially, the deal that was cut is one that was not helpful in addressing some of the most difficult things. Now, those of us who were there, and as you know, I said in one of the committees that did the actual drafting with Arthur and a few other people of the interim constitution, these were hard negotiated bargains. But of course, they were within a particular power setting. And, and therefore, most of this criticism comes out to say the original fundamental notions and vision of a good society has carried over many, many years, at least 350 years, just dissipated in 1994. And you don't see them being rearticulated in a way that young people are able to instantly identify. So the starting point you're going to find is a continual debate about whether the, the leading party of the time, clearly the African National Congress, and the National Party minted something that was genuine to the true aspirations of the majority of the people in the country. And that criticism, of course, you know, leads to the second part, which really is, this explains why the government, in fact, is pretty impotent in converting society into what people fought for for 350 years. So it's a very complicated debate, but it is the debate currently in law schools and amongst young people, to a point that is nearly ahistorical, that nothing happened in 1994. If it did, and then of course you quickly move on to section 25 and the land question, to say, look how this fundamental question was totally fudged. I'm going to come back and talk about more detail. I don't say the argument is all right, I'm saying it's prevalent.
benevolent, it is strong, and reinforced by the parliament's performance of the ruling class in this country. The ruling class has not covered itself in glory. So that argument, even at an academic and jurisprudential level, is quite strong. And I can get to it at a time when it is, becomes appropriate. So in short, I'm really saying we had a process. It was credible in ways, and it has certain features that you could talk about. But to overvalorize what happened in 1994 is to miss something quite fundamental, which is also connected to a misbehaving ruling class that is essentially almost at odds with the needs and hopes of the majority of the people it is ruling. So as I say, it's going to be quite a rough discussion, but I want <laughs> to bring it to you, and I hope you'll be able to join the, the debate. Thank so, you. Thank, thank you, Judge. Mm -hmm. uh, Tembeka, you've written about uh, the, the roots of the Constitution in a different yes. way. You don't start in 1994 yes. when, you, when you look at our roots of um, the content, some of the content of the Constitution anyway, and certain important rights. Uh, do you agree with Justice Musneke or not? <laughs> That's a very difficult question. Uh, <laughs> you know, ask an advocate if they agree with the judge. <laughs> um, uh, firstly, also just to appreciate uh, Adela, as uh, you know, she was very generous in her introduction of me as a uh, a fine, I think she, in fact, she even used finest, not just fine. <laughs> <laughs> but also just to say how incredibly pleased I am that she is facilitating the discussion. Adila is really one of the best advocates we have at the Johannesburg Bar at the moment. <laughs> uh, and also her sort of heart and principles are at the right place. Uh, I heard today that she and Sasha were at the uh, many inquest. I think many of us have forgotten about that inquest. We just remember, say, okay, well, this is the chairperson of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of, anyway, um, so, so just to come back to the, uh, to the yes, I mean, Attila, you're right. I, I try to look at this constitution in a sort of broad historical uh, trajectory uh, as part and parcel of the <laughs> Uh, beginning of the struggle against uh, uh, colonial occupation and the union government. And the language itself, I mean, the language of rights, uh, the language of uh, law, and the language of the constitution is an old language. It's not a 1994 language. Um, and the first, well, not even the first, I mean, there are earlier documents in the 1870s, you know, that speak about the necessity of having. Um, uh, the function of adjudication split from the function of government. You know, and mainly those are African intellectuals of the era, you know, the likes of uh, Soga. But it transforms into legal language, into constitutional text, and into a Bill of Rights for the first time in 1923. Um, and, and, and the fascinating bit about that uh, is that at the time that demand is made, that we demand the Bill of Rights. So that's the ANC. Uh, of fixed legal is like I said. Um, I mean, one can criticize them. That these were uh, the educated elites mm -hmm. of the time. Uh, these were people educated in England and in America. And so they appropriated the language of rights. Uh, but what struck them was actually the hypocrisy of the British. The fact that in England, they were treated as completely equal. Uh, but when they returned to South Africa, the ethos and the values of uh, racial discrimination were actually quite prevalent in the, in, the, in the Union era. So this document of 1923 is itself uh, pregnant with its own internal contradictions and complexities because it demands equality according to the doctrine of Cecil John Rhodes, you know, who, <laughs> who, who declared that there should be equality for all civilized men south of the Zambezi. You know, and, that's the, and that's the ANC document prepared in, in 1923. And it is transformed over time into another great piece of, uh, I think, African imagination. 
which is called the uh, African Claims, but it's got a, a, a section there called the African Bill of Rights, or the Africans' Bill of Rights in other terms. It's Africans' Bill of Rights. It's a long statement of rights. Um, one of the rights that fascinated me when I looked at it was the, uh, the freedom of the press. I mean, look back, why you know, would these men of the ANC in 1941 be interested in the press? And I actually realized that they were proprietors of the press. They owned Abantu Bato. You know, and the dismantling of the press at the time impacted on them. And that's why they demanded the, the right to the freedom of the press. And so you see that transforms from individual rights into sort of, I could say, collective rights in the Freedom Charter. And the Freedom Charter is the most famous of these documents in, 19, of these documents in 1955. And that's all then translated. And in fact, the man who was the inspiration behind the Freedom Charter is that Cape Matthews he conceived the idea in 1953 already when he was the president of the Cape Wing of the ANC in the Eastern Cape. So, and you see this all of it coming together in the 1991. Albi was there then, at that point. Albi was already there. Uh, in the 1991 uh, guidelines for the Bill of Rights. And it's a constellation of this rich and imaginative history of black intellectual thought. So the point I try to make there is that it is very easy, in a sense, to abandon this heritage uh, under this idea of uh, Eurocentrism. You know, everything emanated from Europe. And so I'm trying to reclaim that space of the origins of constitutional thought. And that's why it's actually easy for Oliver Tambo. Uh, I quoted Oliver, but I quoted Albi, <coughs> referring to what Oliver Tambo said. So, but in my book, I said Oliver Tambo said this. But in the footnote, I say Albi says Oliver Tambo said this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so all of that is that. So that's why it's easy for Oliver Tambo and uh, Nelson Mandela to embrace the project. So, constitutionalism and to subject themselves to a system of laws when in fact there was no need for them to do so. They were a legitimate government proper because these were the products of the masses, but they were nevertheless willing to submit uh, to the authority of the law, which I think is one of the greatest inventions of the uh, last 25 years. It's the idea that a government of the people is nevertheless subject to the law. So that's the point I try to claim and try to restore into the, into the debate. I mean, I, I hear what uh, Josh Mosenega is saying about uh, these debates happening at law school. I think that like, there are multiple debates happening, right? There is the debates happening in the law schools, but there are other debates happening in the villages, uh, in the townships, uh, in taxi rank and elsewhere. My experience of that debate, it's demanding the implementation of the constitution. It's demanding houses. It's demand land. It's demanding textbooks. It's, that's a, a demand for the enforcement of the constitution. It's demanding accountability. And so that layer, you know, it's the underclass. I've called them in one paper I wrote as the underclass. That layer has no access to the media. Uh, and that, I think, for me, is one of the greatest tragedies of this uh, disjointed debate that completely cuts out the, uh, the underclass from the debate. And that underclass is not questioning the legitimacy of the constitution, but it is demanding its enforcement. Thank you. Um, Albi, if I could just ask you before we, before we get to the real hard facts here, whether you uh, think that our constitution is perfect uh, and the best in the world. <laughs> <coughs> Or, or whether or whether it has imperfections. Uh, is the constitution perfect? <laughs> Nothing's perfect. Your question isn't perfect. <laughs> 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 but I think. Uh, it's a beautiful constitution and people ask me is there anything you would have done differently and I said the only thing uh, I would have had in the chapter 8 chapter 9 uh, 
institutions of protection of democracy, which is another unique feature, uh, I would have had an anti-corruption institution. <laughs> uh, that's the only substantive change. Uh, I would have also, uh, our plan was to have proportional representation on its own for the first elections. Clean, clear everybody in for making the constitution. And the plan understanding was the second elections would be mixed. Uh, and I favor mixed direct representation, which parliament is, is, is doing now. So uh, it's as good, I don't have any other better constitution, let me put it that <laughs> way, in the world than the South African one. And, and if I have a few moments after the discussion, I'd like to say it wasn't just that we had smart brains, uh, it was the process and not just for consultation, but at a later stage, I'd love a chance to say that why. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one of the things I forgot to do uh, was uh, when I was speaking about the process uh, was to just show you the handwritten, uh, one example of a handwritten submission that was made during uh, the constitution making process and we'll hand it around in a moment. Uh, and, and, and the diversity of views uh, that was, um, that, was that were expressed rather. One view, if I can just say, is women should be able to have abortions only when they have been raped. Um, so, you know, there was a very, very interesting and disparate view from uh, across the sector in the public. So, okay, so this is our constitution and this is what we have. And we've got it through the processes that we went through, the best process we could come up with at the time. Uh, I think progressive uh, processes and, uh, but this is what we have now. So let's get to the brass tacks. And I know one of the questions, and it's just the first question that everybody has in their mind is the property clause. So let's get this out of the way. Uh, Judge, is the property clause a constraint to land distribution? Yeah, um, I'm going to get there in a moment. <clears throat> Let me just tell you, I have a rejoinder on what Albu said. I don't valorize it the way he does. Mm. I think it's there and we've got to live with it. It's more like that. And I can point, and I'll point out about just six, seven defects that I think we could have done better, you know, in hindsight. And I was there, oh, and I, I looked and I think, oh, there's six, seven things that we could have done quite differently. The Bill of Rights is marvelous. The first chapter, I hope we can find time to talk about that. Um, so I'll come back and just point out, I'll be what I think are things that we could have done better. Um, and that are directly connected with the current executive. Oh, you see, when you say something wrong, it goes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wants to say executive. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to say executive, right. Uh, which has a which has an architectural connection with the current executive rot. So I'm not quite in the mood to valorize the constitution as the best and just wonderful. And I want us to have that debate at some time. But I'll come back to that. That's not the question you're asking. L let me just clear the deck. I will give you an opportunity though. To get to that to point. To that. You want me to get to the land question. For now, let's do that. And I suspect you do so because I have an Africanist background, right? <laughs> Amongst other things. <laughs> yes. Land is totally central to my understanding of, of just living and equity. Um, and one of my biggest angers, let me just put it up front, every time I drive in a very urban area and I see so many of our people so poor, so cramped, so landless, so without basic services, without just about anything. It just makes the point that Fanon made eight years ago, just the connection between dignity, space, and land. And, 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 and we, have not, we have not unlocked that. And you move into even semi-rural areas, it's just that congestion, that, that grime, that debt, that poverty and comes to mind et cetera, et cetera. And there are formations, many in our country, that speak to that reality. So the land equity has not been achieved. 
And any suggestion that we have, of course, it is would be bizarre and clearly untrue. Now, what Section 25 does, and I've written, you know, I've published a paper on this, Tim Baker, and very carefully looked at 25 and its import. I think it does a number of good things. I don't have a blanket criticism of it as many people would have. I don't think it's an absolute bar to state action. It starts off by protecting property against <clears throat> arbitrary deprivation. And I make the point that deprivation is in fact by implicitly permitted, provided it's not arbitrary. So the argument that there is a blanket general protection of property is one that is unsustainable jurisprudentially. If the constitution says there shall be no arbitrary deprivation, it means reasonable and rational deprivation may very well be permissible, and it should be permissible in any state. It is a right that is capable of limitation. And you get into the normal test, is the limitation reasonable? And does it advance a public purpose? If the answer is yes, you aim for a way. So I don't see section 25, even one as that big bar that stands in the way of pursuit of land equity by, by government. And I spent a bit of time in this article to go through the mandate of 25. By the time you get to 25, 7, and 8, government is given a fairly big cut blanche to try and achieve access to land by the people of this country. And then I'm going to look at the statistics. I'm going to look at the land code. I'm going to look at the actual land that has been passed on to people. More importantly, Forget the farming land because we talk about that. Surveyed and developed um, peri urban land with infrastructure where most people live. And you see that very, very little has been done. In this article, I roll out the statistics to show you how slow the land claims court has been, how little government has actually done, and how the poverty stands out in your face. Drive down any street. Perry Evan Street in this country, you see. So the government has a clear, open mandate. The last point I make in this article is that, and I'll be here to confirm it, for the time I spent in court, and indeed for the duration of the court, there was not even one expropriation case that came before the Constitutional Court. So our government never dared to expropriate even once in order to advance land justice. I find that remarkable. And rather than going and trying to amend the constitution, section 25, in my view, and I say, I, I commend you to go and look at the article, has enough power for a willing ruling elite to actually deal with the land question. And if there were to be objections to it provided if it leads to deprivation, if it leads to expropriation, provided it is reasonable within the precincts of the law. And lastly, the constitution requires that there will be <clears throat> compensation, but it's just an equitable compensation. The constitution does not even get anywhere near market value. It lists six to eight factors that a court will weigh. So the court is not bound by what the estate agents tell it. It, it has to look at how was the land acquired? For what use was it historically? How is it being used now? How will it advance a public purpose? E.g. give housing to poor people or to build a hospital or whatever else. So a court would put this all this into a basket and saying this was a justified deprivation or justified expropriation. And therefore, and I think that the compensation should be X. So we could have done it, but in my stay on the court, not even once, nor did Arthur have the chance, nor did Fias have the chance, Albion I have the chance. 
So a government sat on their hands and never in all that time tried to expropriate even once. They tried to cut deals with the budget of the land affairs. And it's another story for another day as to what happened to that money. So yes, we have the big thing to deal with. I think Section 25 is permissive and I think a lot could have been done within its parameters. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And, and of course, just a full compensation in the appropriate circumstances may well be zero. Indeed. Indeed, quite often, think about farmers who had given land under the apartheid regime for free. That will be, that will be a vital factor to throw into the scale on whether or not the successor to that farmer, if they were family, ought to be paid large sums which are market related. So if we had just got down to the meeting and did the job, I think many the land justice would have done a lot in achieving land justice in our country, but we did nothing. Mbeka, surely the judge is right. There isn't a right to property in the constitution. That's uh, not how section 25 is. <coughs> and surely the problem is not the provision, but, but our, our government uh, yeah. over the last couple of decades. I mean, even our expropriation act is an apartheid era act. Yes, no, sorry. I actually remember that I brought my constitution. Yes. <laughs> so, so I was actually looking for it when you were talking. Um, yes, I mean, I, I agree. I've, I actually have nothing meaningful to add to what uh, Judge Musenega says about the, the permissive text. Um, I, I, the only thing I would add is that it's not just permissive. It's, it's, it's actually Section 25 is a mandate for transformation. It's obligatory. Now I can prove this by, <laughs> by, by, by take for instance, section 25 <coughs> sub five, the state must take reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to foster conditions which enable citizens to gain access to land on an equitable basis. So it's a mandate. Now, that's the first thing. The second thing I would add, uh, but on his analysis of the structure of Section 25, I mean, it's impeccable. The second thing to add is the transitional period. The claim that was made by those people that purported that there should be an amendment was that this was a product of a compromise, Section 25 in particular. When I was writing Land Matters, I actually looked at the CODESA documents on section 25. Now on the three disputed questions, the ANC won all of them. The first one was whether there should be a right to property. Sheila Kamara, who act, uh, represented the National Party, very skilled, very experienced, very articulate, if you look at the transcripts of those discussions. She demanded the actual right to property, which they had managed to get, by the way, in the interim constitution, but they couldn't get it in the final constitution, so they lost on that. The second thing was whether there should be a right to restitution of land inside of the property clause. The National Party, through Sheila Kamara, opposed the right to restitution. The ANC got it. It's, it's in the section 25.6. They got the right to restitution. And the third one, was that whether there should be a right to adequate, prompt, and full compensation in the event of an expropriation. The National Party insisted on what it claimed was an international benchmark that compensation should be paid at market value and sometimes above, because sometimes you have to be paid for the inconvenience of having to relocate. So you don't just get the value of the property, but you also get compensated for the damages of having to be relocated. That's the international standard they claim. They lost on that. So on the three main questions to Section 25, the ANC won all of them. So this idea of a compromise is itself a distortion because the ANC got what it wanted. But as soon as it got it in 1996, in 1997, it passed a white paper on land reform in which it guaranteed white landowners market value compensation. 
And that came through the influence of the land bank. So this has been the crisis that we've been facing in this country, a policy that is inconsistent with the text of the law. But it's a government policy adopted by the ANC out of its own quote unquote volition. So that's the first thing to add is that is to dispense in a forensic way with the lie of a compromise. And then the other thing to add about this, over time with the land reform, we have had a gradual deterioration in the quality of the institutions. The first land reform commission was comprised of very educated, very able individuals. These regional offices of the uh, commission were it's, uh, themselves very, very strong individuals. Over time, it's been gutted of talent. So you are not going to have this revolution that has no institutions. So for as long as the institutions are dying, you must expect that land reform will die, just like crime will increase. Land reform will not be spared from the consequences of the deterioration in the quality of administration. So one of the points we have not debated with land reform <coughs> is the quality of its administration. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to just want to say that uh, you start off by saying you had nothing meaningful to add. <laughs> <coughs> um, do you have a comment on the land claim sport? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> when I was acting there as a judge, this I agree is anecdotal, but it might be illustrative of a larger uh, malaise. Many of the cases that I had, I dealt with, probably I would say ninety percent were evictions. Now, if you know the structure of the land reform process, evictions are driven by landowners. So they have the money, they ask the lawyers, and, they, and very few cases dealt with claims, in other words, that are driven by land claimants. So the structure is imbalanced in a way that precludes land claimants from being real participating agents. And the state, which has the funds, by the way, the state is not doing much to assist land claimants. So if you are a land claimant, what do you need to successfully prosecute a claim? So a land claimant needs, firstly, a historian, someone who's going to validate that there was indeed a, because there are two questions you must ask in the land claim. The one is a causative question. In other words, where you, did you lose the land as a result of, to answer the causation question, as a result of racial discrimination. Once you've answered that, then you must answer the question as to whether you are the right person. So you could be the individual who was actually dispossessed or the descendant, or sometimes you may be the community. And those debates can actually become intractable. So you need a historian to disentangle them for you. Many poor people have no access to historians, and many historians are not learned historians. The second thing you need is a property valuer, Some, someone to tell you how much the property was at the time of dispossession, and how much is it today, or an accountant, or somebody to crunch the numbers for you. Sometimes you may need an anthropologist, because you may find that there is a problem of tribal overlaps. An anthropologist could disentangle that as well for you. Always you need a lawyer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Many people are locked out of access to those four key resources you need to successfully prosecute a claim. Mm -hmm. And that's a structure that needs to be rebalanced if you want to put this thing back on its trajectory. And that's why I talk about when I say build the institutions up. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, one of the ironies uh, is that in a constitutional mm -hmm. democracy, it's the people with the most power yeah. who are able to shape what the constitution means in, in, in the world that we live in. Um, uh, which brings me to the next thing, which is totally... Just, just before you do, can I very yes. quickly, I agree entirely. <laughs> <laughs> so I've written it's about... It's not it. working. <clears throat> it's not working. <clears throat> okay. We should disagree sometime. We must plan it. Uh, I just wanted to add that one of the least resourced courts has been the land claims court. Mm. And then got stuck by legalism and all of the lack of resources that have been explained now. 
it's it's a total tragedy. But uh, what I wanted to add was willing buyer, willing seller emerged from some policy document. 2007. 2000, so, uh, 1997. 1997 within, and somebody formulates, no, actually, it has to be a willing buyer and a willing seller. Of course, we all know by now, it appears nowhere in the Constitution. It never was a requirement, is not a requirement. Government has certain powers and duties that we've already explained. And that stood in the way, everything therefore was negotiated. And these officers sitting in the, in, in, in the land department had this big budget and often went to farmers and negotiated these amounts that would be paid to farmers. And anecdotally, usually they would suggest to the farmer, your farm is actually 100 million, not 50 million. And you know what, what's next to follow, right? <laughs> and I'll be, we almost had something in Malilani with that big, big farm, where, which was settled for a 1 billion rand while it was enrolled at the Constitutional Court. And, um, but the money was kept where and where and where, but it never came to be heard. So I just wanted to say, willing yeah. buyer, willing seller was again, the ruling elite creating a real serious impediment to land justice. Yeah. And um, the difference between land and other socioeconomic rights is that it requires the government, yeah. the state to actually be the one to be the agent. The one thing about socioeconomic rights, as people in this room know, is that there are organizations that individuals can assert their rights, sure. so whether it's to toilets or textbooks or, or nutrition and so on. Um, so, so this is closely connected to the, the land question is, is closely connected because of the aspirational value in our constitution of social justice. It's connected to socioeconomic rights. And when I started off, I spoke about one defining feature of the constitution being that it includes socioeconomic rights and it imposes positive obligations on government to fulfill those rights. But we could also talk about the reality in this country when it comes to access to basic education and who has access to quality education. And the people who have access to quality education are the people who can afford to pay for it. Whether you pay for it in the public system because you go and live in an area like I live in where I could send my children to a public school because it's a well-resourced area or because you buy private school education. If you've got the money, you'll buy the right. If you have the money, you will buy access to healthcare services. So as wonderful as it is that we have this, and Justice Mosineke, you have written about this in a number of your judgments, the, the centrality of equality, and particularly substantive equality in our constitution. But what, what do you have to say about where we are now, despite the fact that we have substantive equality as the court has developed that notion and socioeconomic rights in the constitution? Sure. <clears throat> Much of that was written, of course, during the honeymoon stage of, uh, you know, of our constitution, of our democratic project. And we have beautiful jurisprudence that we wrote all around. Only Ayla today, I was reading your judgment in, in in PE, <clears throat> municipality, um, protecting so-called unlawful uh, occupiers and so on. So there's a lot of work we did around that. Let me just draw out one contradiction very quickly. And that is that when we acquired power in 1994, we imposed on ourselves, i.e. the state, the duty to deliver on all of these things. And therefore, a lot of the brokenness that came historically had actually to be mended by us. We, we, we were to give people access to quality health care. We were, in other words, we assumed the obligations of actually of remedying our society. And I often say that unlike other constitutions, ours very pointedly and open-eyed sought to move society from one point to the other, whereas other Constitution simply record the power relations in society. Um, a big debate on its own, it looks like it is not. 
the many courts and places to believe and judges to believe the constitution is not transformative at all in intent. But plainly it is, in my view, is plainly <coughs> social democratic, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and was intended to actually help change our society to, to a better place. And having cleared that out, the struggle started quite early with HIV and AIDS, you know, mm. and, um, and access to nev nevirapine, and right through to, to life as a demani. In each of those cases, I'll be, I never stopped noticing and wondering, the defendants were state, were government. So was the case yesterday of delivering textbooks uh, in Limpopo, defendants government, you've done many of those. Pete toilets, defendant government, executive government in particular. And we can talk later about whether we have actually architecturally arranged executive power appropriately. It's a discussion that, that should be had. I think that's probably one of the biggest defects in, 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 a, in, in the architecture of our constitution. The consequence of all this is that, you know, the Hrudboom thing, the, and we can go to just about most of the key things that we ordered in court should be done. Most did not happen. Way intentions were expressed that they would happen. We know that the money was diverted in a variety of ways. Forget about the money. Just leaving the institutions to cave in and therefore incapable of being able to do what we assumed voluntarily in 1994, that we will remedy our, our society. And, 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 and in many ways, therefore, people tend to look at the constitution and these rights, which in many ways were, you know, were certainly <clears throat> pathfinders, the new terrain. I'll be, you know, the debate that Olus has had about third generation rights. We got that right. Mm. And we just could not get it done in a way that, and you and I had to do life as a demand. It was heart wrenching. And you look at it back, it's really about a people assuming a high value, high ethical mandate. And they basically, I won't use the word that I have in my mind. <clears throat> they just don't do it, Messerock. They, they just don't get there and, and do what we have to do. So I'm not one of those who think the constitution is all useless. I think it is great in many ways. But damn, we have to get out there and honor the obligations that we made to, in favor of our people, in contrast to our oppressors. And we meant to be those who occupy that high ground, that ethical compass that we're supposed to be, we should be to be those torchbearers. And it's difficult to, to say, to call us that or lead us of society with a straight face. Mm. I mean, I think, Tebeka, you know, and your point about institutions, in this case, uh, uh, it's about leadership. It's about leaders, uh, not just institutions that fail. The one institution, I dare say, that works is the judiciary. But we can't rely on the judiciary to fulfill socioeconomic rights. So what's your comment? Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, judges are important um, to interpret the can law. You, can you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> uh, although they don't always get the law right. <laughs> <laughs> Except that at the Constitutional Court, they always get it right. <laughs> so, so, I mean, judges are important. It's an important sphere of the setup in the Constitution. So it's important who gets in. And it's also important how they get in. And it's important what they do after they are in that office. And those three questions, society has an interest in ensuring that there are no avoidable mistakes about who becomes a judge and what they do and what process is to be followed before one becomes a judge. And that is why, rightly, society is outraged 
at the behavior of certain people in the judicial selection process. It's rightly outraged about it because it is a matter of manifest public interest who becomes a judge. And the reason for it is because a judge in a democratic setup wields people's power delegated to him by the Constitution. It's not his power, it's people's power. But he does so without an election, or she does so without an election. So on the one hand, on a pure democratic perspective, is illegitimate. But on the other hand, in a constitutional democratic sense, is entitled to exercise power, to constrain people's power. And so who we select, how we select, is absolutely a vital question. I would like to hear uh, Judge Musenegi about this point that I'm making. Let me make a second point, um, which is the, this, thing, uh, this point he was making <coughs> about education. There has been progress with education, especially with universal access. If one looks at what this country was like in 1994 with the consequences of Bando education, and the extent to which black children had no access at all to primary schooling. The greatest success has been universal access to education at a primary schooling level, which has reduced the levels of illiteracy. But the problem is not there. The problem is that there is a gradual reversal of that foundation of universal access uh, to education in order to reduce illiteracy and innumeracy. And those are the two things that the government is not doing well. As a lawyer, it is almost impossible to litigate the quality of education. You can litigate desks and chairs and books and perhaps even teachers. But what is proving immensely difficult is litigating the quality, the outputs. So you have children going through the schooling system but being illiterate going through the schooling system, but being unable to count. The big question for the future is how do we actually match access with quality outputs? And what is the way in which rights, because we work through the Bill of Rights, what is the way in which rights should translate that access into quality education? Quite apart from the fact that mad schools and all of those things, those are things we can do. But I think the greatest problem we face is the, is the matching of access with the quality of education. And you see this huge gap. White children are getting better education by far on a proportional basis than black children. And this is for me the greatest indictment of the black government is that it's racially discriminating against black children. And it can no longer say that it doesn't know that it is racially discriminating because the outputs are there. Every day we see the outcomes. Mm. So that for me seems to be the area of need for the greatest intervention right now in education. Can I just tell you that um, the, our government uh, in response to the Pit Latrine case uh, in Limpopo has on affidavit, on oath, said they can't begin to fix it until 2030. <laughs> so, 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 so what you are asking for, I mean, toilets is, is, it's really, it's just logistical. What you are asking for is much more than that. So if, if we can only start with toilets in 2030, then I fear that we, we have no hope of, of being able to do this important exercise you're talking about of matching access and quality. But Tembeka, who should become a judge? And how? Yes. Firstly, there is a basic requirement in the Constitution that the person must be appropriately qualified. If we can start there. <laughs> Secondly, and appropriately qualified means that they must have an LLB and they must have the experience of having been a lawyer in one capacity or the other, either as an attorney or an advocate or as an academic, but being involved in the administration of justice. Secondly, the Constitution demands um, transformation of the judiciary. And that has been a contentious question. And the reason it has become contentious is because on the one hand, 
you have a powerful lobby that claims that if you demand transformation, you are lowering the standards. And then on the other hand, you have people who say, forget about the standards, let's just get anyone as long as they are transforming the institution. The question is striking the balance between those two. But we are not having an honest debate that that is what is going on. And so behind the scenes, on the corners, people say, look at these judges that are being appointed, they're incompetent. But they don't want to say, look at these black judges. Right? And yet they should be honest enough to make that point clear. So apart from qualifications, we need at least people with some ethical and moral compass. We have enough corruption in government. We don't want it in the judiciary. So it must be clear that someone must be appointed with a clear ethical and moral compass. Now that answers the first of your questions about who should be appointed. It doesn't answer the question of how. The current way of appointing judges is wrong and it is not in accordance with the constitution because it is in pursuit of interests, not in pursuit of the goals of the constitution. The Judicial Services Commission is not a body to pursue personal interests, settle political scores. When the commissioners sit collectively, their idea must be in the pursuit of the goal of the Constitution. But the institution is being abused at the moment in pursuit of either personal interests or political interests. We have to fix the way the Judicial Services Commission works. Its composition is not a problem because it is necessary in a democratic setting to have a diverse views uh, from a political point of view. The problem is that that diversity is not enriching the process. It is detracting from the enrichment of the process. And that is why I supported the litigation uh, a year ago on those nominations that were done, that the process that is producing these judges is a totally flawed process. So we have to rethink the modality of the selection of our judges. At the moment, I'm afraid it's going the wrong direction. And I think that judges of quality are too afraid now to appear before JSC, um, having witnessed what, what, what can be put through. Justice yes, Mosineke, well, you, 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 Tembeka has invited me to put this question to you, and you're a big <coughs> boy, you can answer the question yes, about I mean, judicial appointments. You, your youth chose from time to time <laughs> <coughs> when you require retired judges to enter the, you know, the, the fray, uh, the current fray. Um, judges are important. <coughs> They're important because the people, they represent the best and the finest interest of our people. And they've got to keep that balance going. I tell the angry young people I've talked about when the beginning, you don't beat up the referee and think you're still going to have a rugby match or a soccer match, okay? You've got at least to leave the referee to, to do the work if at least you want to continue playing or having a society that is ordered like ours. So they remain absolutely important. In the last 25 years, 27 should have shown their value to society, I think. And therefore, yes, we have to take a number of steps to protect them. Um, we need the best amongst the lawyers to be guardians of our society. And we need to revisit, I won't be as explicit as you, the JSC, to make sure that it actually does its work properly. And I think I admired, I'll be when we started, is diversity. And he drew from the legislature, from the executive, from the, but in no time, all these were corralled into groups and interests. And I've chaired the JSC a good few times as acting chief justice, um, or in the absence of Pas Langa and or Mokweng Mokweng, and people lobby to hell and back. We have to find a way to standardize and objectify the, the way in which you actually do it so that we can exclude all of the processes that you, that you talked about. And, and yes, quality is also going to be everything about judges. I think 
Transformation does not mean race or gender only. We really get lost when we go down the road. These are important components, but only given where we come from. But I can happily tell you that as high as like 65% of our judges are people of color, that high. There's no head of court in this, in this country who's not, who's not black. Um, women judges remain more around 30% now, 28, 30%, they should be much higher than that. And um, black male judges sit quite high up in percentage in the judiciary. Sky seven come down and the quality has been reasonable. And, um, and I can tell you, we're glad that we don't have <clears throat> challenges of, of corruption as you would find in the executive. So we must really go and protect. We must truly go and protect that institution. And the JSC, I agree with you, is the first part of call. And open debates about, about judgeship. And, and we should be quite frank and open. Loyalty to the constitution and the high values of our society should be far more important and valuable and the ethical component you talked about than how people look and what their agenda is. That must come into the fray, but certainly only as second or third in, in the assessment. Um, thank you, Judge. So um, you spoke earlier about architect architectural defects in the Constitution. So I'll, before we open up for conversation and questions from the floor, if you could make changes to the Constitution, what changes would you make? Cheryl Carolas, are you ready? Are you ready to hear this? <laughs> <laughs> because we go around the world and tell everybody we have the best Constitution. We do in many features. You've heard me valorize in Section 25 of the Constitution. We have inducted a democracy. It's overseared by rule of law. We, by and large, are governed by law. It's something that we cannot abandon. We cannot beat up the referee and throw away the rules book. We need it in order to be able to actually change the lives of our people. And I agree with you that they clamor properly for implementation of the Constitution. Here's the defect I'm talking about. Unwittingly, and I've written somewhere about it, you'll find in some published article in a journal, we created an imperial presidency. I have a schedule, I can read it to you, I brought it along here. Just about everything that wills executive and other power in this country is appointed by the president. Starting from the chief judge, starting from the deputy president. Remember that a, pres a president can fire a deputy president at will. And this country has been there, right? With deleterious impact when a deputy president was fired not so long ago. The president can appoint the chief justice, appoint the deputy chief justice, appoint president of the court, appoint the head of the army, appoint the head of intelligence, appoint the head of the NPA, appoint the head. Think about it, the president appoints. So there is a remarkable concentration of executive power sitting at a particular place. And the consequence of this, and I think it was quite unwitting, consequence of this is that there are insufficient mechanisms to be able to temper that open-ended power of, of presidency and get the right candidate into the presidency then you'll have a bit of a jigga jigga. You'll have a bit of a dance, right? And we've had it not so long ago. If the president is really overloading just about everything. Forget the name of the president, but that is one defect which I think sits and points out. The other is the president <clears throat> appoints a cabinet. That is fine. But appoints it from the ranks of members of parliament. So everybody in parliament, at least in the ruling party, aspires to become a cabinet minister. <laughs> what, what, what do you think their level of <clears throat> the, the appetite to keep the president accountable would be? 
You remember motions of no confidence, five, six, seven of them, and they will all merrily vote against that. The, the, so the architecture we've created is every MP aspires, at least in the ruling party, aspires to become a member of, to become a cabinet minister with a car and bodyguards and a home in Pretoria, a home in Cape Town, and you know, I don't know how many 52 business class tickets between Cape Town and Jobek and Wara Wara and Wara Wara. And we go on and on. So <clears throat> when we are to write again, we certainly have to think about it. Three, I'll be, I think the values of accountability, openness, <clears throat> responsiveness sit out there. Wonderful. But we haven't done enough to make sure that they're actually observed. If you ask me, the weak link in the Constitution is architecture of the executive. Parliament votes money, makes laws, and leave all that in the hands of the executive. And the executive does with it what we all have seen in the last 27 years. So this, 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 and we should think through how we best disperse that power, how we best police it, how we best make sure that we don't have acting DGs in every department, how we don't wake up to the news like this morning, that billions of rent seems to have been siphoned out of Department of Water Affairs. And look at just the misery that our people live in without supply of water. And it turns out that billions and billions have been stolen, at least it's so it is alleged, by a minister who was on TV this morning. So, Lot, we have to revisit the architecture of our executive power and the real strictures. Only the courts for a long time policed that power. And that's why we became un so unpopular, of course. So we have to think through Tembega, more innovative ways of protecting institutions, of creating higher levels of independence, and of holding to account executive power in particular. I'll stop there for a while, I think. Mm, that's there great. are other difficulties around the electoral system I'll be talked about, but I won't go there now. Tembeka, in a quick minute, what would you change, if anything? Uh, yeah, I mean, I sort of spend my time thinking more about implementing the Constitution. Mm. I, honestly, I, I mean, you know, I, firstly, I, I don't valorize anything. I, there's no text that you can worship. No, it's not the Bible, so we must always remain skeptical <laughs> and critical of the text. But, you know, Adila, we've had 25 years of this document. On Tuesday, I was in Grahamstown in the High Court asking for books for black children in the Eastern Cape who are being discriminated against on the grounds of race by the government, intentionally, because it is aware. So there's no longer a, po a point about, we don't know. It's intentional because they now know. So the greatest problem we have is that the constitution exists in name. And what I'm worried about is the fact that we are not making it to exist also in practice. I think that's the greatest problem we face in this country is that we have an unmatched multitude of aspirations that are embodied in this document. Every text is necessarily ambiguous, necessarily indeterminate, necessarily far-reaching, but also capable of conservative interpretations, etc. You can never get a perfect text. In fact, the Section 25 process showed us particularly the problems of the text, because when you asked these campaigners, give me the alternative text, they couldn't. They gave ultimately five different texts. They couldn't even agree about those texts. Because the problem is never the text. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, we have some time for questions and answers. So, uh, Mondi is very quick off the mark. <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can we get a mic, please, to Mondi? Is he here as journalist or as citizen? <laughs> 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 I think City Press was.
first land and the Saudi have rulers. Yeah. It's the governing party. <laughs> accept that, accept that. <laughs> but the problem yeah. remains. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so to say, um, Tembega, you spoke, I think, correctly about the fact that that the that the people, that ordinary people, are demanding that the yeah. constitution be implemented, yeah. um, and that's actually the voices that we should be listening to. But the reality is that that the narrative of those who are saying that the constitution is the block, the constitution is the problem, that is they, those other people, if we, if we can put it this way at the bottom, they are not articulating their support of the constitution, they are demanding that the constitution um, meets their needs. Those who are undermining the constitution and are saying the constitution, they are actually articulating and they are loud, and they are heard, and they are getting more mainstream. They have a home in the governing party. They have a home in many influential pockets of society. They have a home in, worryingly, more, more and more in your profession, the people who should actually be actually defending and, as you said, implementing the constitution. And, and unfortunately, it is, it is a section of our community, of our society, that as influential as they are and as educated as they are, that you cannot argue with. I mean, you, you, you have presented facts. You present those facts, it goes way, way over their heads and the argument becomes even more and, and, and arguments becomes more and more ludicrous. There's something that, there's one that's growing now about the fact that, um, that Joe Slovo wrote about the sunset clauses in himself. So, I mean, like that's as much as, yeah. That's yeah. something that's now coming to the fore. Um, just to, now my question is, if you have such influential pockets of society, and unfortunately, as the DCJ has pointed out, that even at law schools, future lawyers, future judges are actually speaking in, are being poisoned in, in that way. What do we do at this point in 20, 22, 25 years um, since the adoption of our constitution? What do we do to deepen and actually make sure that the next generation does not buy into that poison, that this constitution actually does become, in it, with, it, with, in, with its imperfections, does actually become a, a permanent feature of our democracy. <laughs> um, Monty, I just don't know what the answer is, but I, I agree with everything you've said. I, I, I think that that's, that's my primary worry, that's exactly, that's what, that's what occupies me. I, I don't give a lot of a time to uh, sort of anti-constitutional uh, discussions. I, I, I'm very impatient with them because, you know, when I go to my village, uh, no one ever says to me that uh, the, the, their demand in their lives is an amendment to the constitution. You know, what? And, and most of this debate is not actually an honestly held view. You know, it's a cover. You know, it's usually a cover. Either a cover for political power, a cover for some sort of uh, intellectual dominance, but it's usually a cover, you know. But we must carry on patiently, slowly, quietly, but we should never stop. The, 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 the constitution, constitutions across the world, good constitutions like ours, I mean, we can, people can say, this is a good constitution, this is the bottom line, this is a good constitution. So good constitutions do not self-execute or self-survive. They are held on by good people. So we, we must firstly protect, defend, deepen, advance the essence of constitutionalism. 
sometimes against the government, sometimes against the ANC. You know, in the last four years, ANC has wasted everyone's time asking poor people if they want land. Yet it's rise on the trail. The reason the party was formed was to give black people land. So sometimes we fight against that narrative inside the party, right? Because that is intentional, it's diversionary. It's a cover for the failure of the last 25 years. We must call that out. So the key is not to stop, not to surrender, is to keep pushing the right message. Yeah, I know, I know, so. And not to be cowed by the intimidating noises, because that's the intention, is to silence the voices of constitutionalism. So that's the only thing I can offer you, I'm afraid. <laughs> Tandy. <coughs> Sorry. No, 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 you got, Tandy must go ahead. Uh, thanks, Adila. And, um... Judge, you can answer that question after this. No, no, no. Uh, my question is in the form of an assertion. Firstly, I must thank you both uh, for, uh, I mean, the engagements, because they are quite thought-provoking. But the point I want to put on the table to you both is that this, to me, is a misdirected question. Or it's a question that we will all agree on about the Constitution because the problem is not the constitution, and that we should more look at the people. And I think in various ways, you've pointed at the people as the problem. And therefore, how do we address that, the issue which we see in corruption, and it's people who are corrupt. The issue we see in the way the people in the judicial service and council have behaved, and it's not the principles there, it's the people themselves. And uh, as you say, if you look at the five presidents of the country, each person has put a different stamp to the executive. And you may agree with one or not agree with the other, but that has not impacted on the constitution itself in the way they have, that they have dealt with things. And one can give more and more examples. And I just feel that we as the elite tend to engage on things that are maybe superficial or they may be out of line with what the people in the village want, actually. And that's what you see on the ground. So I thought maybe I should turn this and find out whether any thoughts on that have been engaged with. Thanks. Judge and Tabeka, before you respond, can I just take one or two more, and then you can deal with a few at once? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Thanks. I've been directed behind. Oh, yeah, the purple mic. Purple mic? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I was waiting to be guided. Uh, I'm Khotso Maja. Um, my question is quite uh, quick, and it arises from what I interpret as a contradiction between the text of the Constitution in Section 25 and what the policy became in 1997. And also on the basic assumption that squarely the responsibility lies with the lawmakers. Now the question is, the process that we use now to elect members of the different legislatures and councils, is it a watertight process? I understand, of course, on the one hand, you want to make sure that the outcome or the composition of those legislatures is a direct reflection of the will of the people, so to say. But how do you still within that infuse a certain minimum capability? You know, the capability, for instance, to align and create a consistency between the object and the spirit of the Constitution on the one hand, and the resultant pieces of legislation that these members of the legislatures are charged to create. How do we strike that balance? Uh, and, and this is a question I'm posing to both esteemed speakers. It's a question I've also been for some time struggling with in terms of how do you elect your parliamentarians in a way that allows us to produce the best quality pieces of legislation? Thank you. Question at the back. All right. Um, yes, all right. Thank you, Adila. Um, I'm my companion, and I guess you could say I'm one of the angry young people but I am a constitutionalist. And 
I have two questions, but they are fundamentally connected. The first is to Tembeka, who asserts that the Constitution is not Eurocentric. And in my understanding of what the distinguished ad advocate said, it's because African claims and other documents similar that use the language of rights were written by black men. But as Fanon points out in Black Skin, White Masks, just because something is written by someone black doesn't make it African. So when we look at the fact that these men in themselves were educated in London and the United States, that they adopted the language of rights, and in African claims, they even adopt the language of roads in saying rights for civilized men south of the Zambezi, where civilization is in itself a white construct. Is that not a case in point, that it was a Eurocentric worldview adopted by Africans that gave birth to the language of rights for liberation? And the further question that follows from that is that both the judge and the advocate, and even you, Adil, are very progressive lawyers, I would say, um, and agree in terms of the socioeconomic rights of the Constitution. But when we were to give a report card for someone like myself who has lived under the Constitution for my whole life, has the Constitution delivered in creating a society that was antithetical to the one that preceded it? And the question, I guess, that's fundamental that I want all of you to kind of feed into is, is the law and the instrument of the law the right instrument for a transformation of a society? And the rest of the continent looks at us, and I want to ask, is constitutionalism and the passing of a new constitution the right way to usher in a new society? Thank you. One last question from Uncle Mavuso, and then we have answers. <laughs> okay. Uh, three legs, I hope I'm yes. allowed to <laughs> just sit down. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thanks very, very much for the high level of debate. Um, there was reference to the 1997 white paper, which I suppose led to a land reform uh, situation which uh, talked about uh, willing seller, willing buyer. I would like to know, should we not be declaring that portion of legislation unconstitutional? <laughs> um, and, and I would suggest that we take practical actions to achieve that. I don't know who can, I, I don't have the money, I'll come to that by the way, but I think it's unconstitutional from what we've been told today, and there was no dispute between the two. The next point is, uh, I didn't quite understand whether the judge was saying that uh, we went overboard, probably didn't on education, um, undertaking to reverse things over which we had no responsibility. I, if that's not what you said, I would still say that would have been able to achieve a lot more for people, not only in education, but in the supply of, in the provision of essentials for people, water, housing, and all. If <clears throat> the government prioritized its budget accordingly, um, there is a, enough money, I suspect, I, I, would, I would argue, that goes into government to address a lot of the things that remain unaddressed. But, you know, South Africa has more embassies than most countries in the world. Um, and you want, if that money was, if, if there were two, I don't think it's the constitution that should say that, but a certain percentage of the budget that you receive should go towards addressing the needs of the people. I, I think you would, um, you would, you would, we would be able to, um, achieve, perform a better than, a lot better than what we're doing now. Um, but the last point, just to not take up too much time, is one shortcoming of uh, the Constitution, if it's the Constitution, is that justice is too expensive for ordinary people. 
you, you really just cannot find justice if you don't have money. Thank you. Thank you. Judge, sure. there's a range of, range of <clears throat> questions there. Six, Some... seven interesting and, and challenging questions. Um, let's try and go quickly so that more and more people can find opportunities to speak. Um, let me start with the ideological stroke philosophical question about Eurocentrism and whether or not the constitution is has <clears throat> foundations which are able to transform society entirely. I don't think the debate is entirely uh, unuseful. <laughs> I do not, Tembega might, I don't. I do think that the project that we are engaging um, ne needs to move us away from all oppressions and inequalities that are consistent with a with coloniality. In other words, with a society organized in a way that would preference and privilege um, people by virtue of class, race, origin, and so on, way of looking at the world. The only good knowledge, the only epistemology is the one that originates from the West. So this is a legitimate point that young people make repeatedly. For instance, the point gets thrown at, why was Ubuntu left out of the second constitution, the final? You were asked it was in the, in the interim constitution. So people are challenging, but what I agree with Tembeka is the fact that we must own <clears throat> much of the thinking and the origins of our constitution. I think it's a social democratic constitution. I think it's not a mere piece of a liberal rambling that some people call. And I think historically, it's an important document to be able to take us to the next level, which brings us to your point. Um, there's a category era of thinking when you collapse what people fail to do with what a document that contains high mission and intention of a society um, requires on the other end. We are at a very terrible space where in fact most of the high principles and values of the constitution are under threat precisely because of human limitations and failure. So how do you bridge it? Same question that Monty asked. It's very difficult to bridge it. I've said to a number of young people in law school as well, the highest form of accountability, frankly, in society is electoral accountability. In the end, it's electoral exercise that confers power, which brings us to the legislature. I happen to think, by the way, that our legislature has done pretty well in terms of making laws. We have some of the best around town. Um, have they kept the executive accountable? I think not. I think they failed dismally. But one shouldn't confuse the two. I think actually we have been good at law making and our legislature has been appropriating money to the executive. Dadim Sima. To do all the good things that ought to be done, whether it's water or schooling, et cetera. And the, the jury's out. I mean, the jury's not out. It's obvious that we're not having quality education, not having institutions that are robust enough. So our biggest challenge currently is how to be able to get an executive arm of state that can live through the constitution. Most of the, I think the, Criticism, I'm looking for a much stronger word than that, around the, cons the democratic project is the fact that we don't achieve the objectives of the constitution. If we were to, and that is why in my part, you have to look to electoral accountability because I hold the view, and I think it's a correct one, that the constitution never intended to promise security of tenure. 
Democracy is always premised on insecurity of tenure. Nobody should be assured that they'll be around until Jesus Christ come. <laughs> it's such utter nonsense because truly every five years somebody should test whether or not you're still entitled to exercise executive power over those that have conferred the power on you. So remember that if I've said many things today, take away one thing, electoral accountability and insecurity of tenure. And when people know that their tenure is insecure, they're likely to behave a little better than they are doing now. Thanks. I've tried to cover most of the questions, certainly not all now. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, what are the things that are going to make a difference? Um, so, I mean, uh, so for land, which is the area I've studied uh, academically the most, we need better institutions, we need more money, we need better people. And those are the things that are going to change things. It's strengthening the institutions, getting people, and shifting the budget again. And I think that formula can be applied to everything else. I mean, the, the Fanon point, I can you know, spend a lot of time reading. Initially, I took the criti critique seriously. I no longer do. The, the, the point is this. The origins of rights for um, African lawyers who I have traced as the first thinkers, it's possible that that research more still needs to be done. Maybe there are other people that thought about this before then. The origins of rights were political, purely political. The first rights demand was equality. It was equality. That was the first rights demand. But that was a political claim. It was not yet a legal claim. It was purely political. And the reason for it was simple this. White people who came to this country from Europe uh, from 1652, and uh, 4,000 of them in 1820 that came here via boats as well, were not interested in inequality. They were interested in pillage and plunder. The people that were interested in equality were Africans. So the language is European, but the incorporation is entirely African, and it is intended to serve a purely African aim of creating equality in a state that is founded on inequality. That's the claim I make in The Land is Ours. When they took this debate seriously in 1941, you know what had happened there is actually a fascinating story. There was a war, the so-called Second World War. South Africa was a very important player in global affairs through its Prime Minister, Jan Smuts, highly respected in Europe. Uh, including by uh, Sir Winston Churchill, who used to call him to some of the cabinet mi meetings. Jan Smuts was about to travel to Europe because they were debating the, what to, to do with the League of Nations. The key demand in Europe at the time was self-determination, and mainly it was around what to do with Nazi-occupied Europe. Dr. Kuma, who was at the time the president of the ANC, thought that Smuts is being hypocritical in insisting on self-determination for Europeans when all of Africa is under white rule. So when he adopted that Bill of Rights, it was again an entirely African agenda of self-determination also for Africans. Smuts rejected the challenge when it was put to him by Alfred Kuma, and using very derogatory words, which again I've traced and I've, I've put in two books. So the claim of the Eurocentric origins of our constitutional thought is bogus, utterly bogus. It is totally ahistorical. What happened is that there was a movement again in the 80s, a constitutional movement, which it undoubtedly was driven by white liberal lawyers, attorneys and advocates, people like Bezos, Charles Kassim and them, who drove that project. The big question for me that would have made a difference is what was the attitude of the ANC 
to that debate. Tambo, Nelson Mandela, embraced the project of constitutionalism. Why? And that is why Aldous Sachs' connection was revealing for me of the commitment of Oliver Tambo to constitutionalism. And by the way, Oliver Tambo supported constitutionalism even in exile in MK, insisting on the application of the Geneva Convention. So there is just no, I mean, Monty raised this point, there is just no credible argument on the Eurocentric origins. It's just people say it because you know, it gives them legitimacy in certain debates, but it's entirely bogus. We are well into injury time. And yes. I think there's a big raging debate out there about the extent to which it is African thought and the extent to which it is Eurocentric. But it's a debate for another day because it matters not. In the end, there is a ground rule and it's a ground rule that ought to take us to our nirvana. And it's not quite happening. <laughs> but there is a, a, a quite a good and, and an actually absorbing and interesting intellectual and jurisprudential debate yes, about, I mean, I, I, you know, I agree, about exactly the point. So, so I, Judge, you wouldn't say it's bogus. You wouldn't use the word. That's no, no, certainly not. I mean, that's why I say for once I found something I differ with him. Yeah. I would want to invite a few good young professors. I don't see them here. Professor Manzingosi, Professor Mudiri, Professor Mokas. I mean, there's about eight, ten of them who are writing quite profusely about whether or not, what are the origins and have we done well enough. I think as a practical document, History has thrusted on us. It is important to that extent. And then they ask the question, is it capable of transforming our circumstances? Follows inevitably the question. Because the, the whole notion of Eurocentrism is that it serves interests other than those of the majority African people. Yeah, but that, isn't that a different question to its actual origins, which is my preoccupation? Yes. The question as to its contemporary exigencies and uses mm. depends on us, not on white people. About that we agree? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to read my own liberator, okay? which you have read, right? Yes, which, which, by the way, it I depends on before. us. We are own liberators. <laughs> I'm saying it is questionable whether the debate can be tagged as bogus because I think there is a legitimate area and terrain of debate on, on the issue. And who should set it right? Us. That's why I say it matters not who originates the constitution and its text. Look at us actually being more horrible to our people than our very oppressors. So it, it matters not, frankly. Yeah, anyway. Thank you, thank you both. Uh, we, we are so well into injury time. I had a few minutes ago, I thought I would still take a last round because it's such a rare uh, privilege to have uh, the panelists on a platform, let alone both of them together. Uh, I can tell you neither of them easily accepts uh, invitations to public uh, events and public platforms, but we, we've, we've really uh, had a fantastic discussion. We're going to leave it here. Uh, we've had a fantastic discussion, and I'm, I'm so grateful for both contributions from both the panelists. We have a few minutes for uh, Cheryl Corollas to please close uh, uh, the proceedings this evening. Um, so Cheryl, if you can please take the platform for the last couple of words. Cheryl's being briefed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Let me start off by just asking us all to give our panelists just a great round of applause. <laughs> it feels corny to applaud three outstanding jurists but I think we should. 
because our country and indeed the world is a very troubled place. And I think not least of all, the biggest measurement and indictment to people like ourselves is the fact that, especially post the COVID pandemic and in many ways through the COVID pandemic, some of the worst behaviors and characteristics of the frailties of human beings have come to the fore. The sheer feral behavior we could not have imagined. And so if you were poor to start off, what this pandemic has done has just made life so much harder. And I guess we are definitely not people who find ourselves currently in there. We may come from there. And so to sit and have this conversation in a world that is not a nice place is quite important. I don't think it's indulgent. I think it imposes on us a particular responsibility. And already we've started the very fact that you are all here says that you are troubled. Uh, not just uh, Justice Musimeke. He asked me how am I when we were walking, and I said, you know we're not okay. <laughs> the reason why we are here tonight is because we are not okay. But the reason why we're here tonight is because I think we have owned the responsibility. We might not quite know how we are fully going to get out of here, but I think every one of us in this room have reclaimed some of that responsibility because let's be honest, in many ways, perhaps because we were so starry-eyed, whatever the reasons may have been, the net effect of that is we've outsourced our responsibilities primarily to a state. We've become so statist in our approach that we look to government consistently to change things. My big appeal to you tonight, to all of us, myself included, as I need some serious talking to, to give me some hope here, uh, to say we can do this. Well, all I know is I tell myself, we have got to do this. It's not a question of whether we can or can't. Well, we just, hell, we just have to do it. Is to say that let us reclaim what gave us this constitution. What gave us the fact that we cannot lock up Justice Moseneke or, in fact, Adila or Tembeka for what they say here. You can't. People can't. But Mondli would have been in jail a lot more than what he has been under apartheid. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the torture that people like Mondli were subjected to and that informs a lot of his journalism just cannot happen as willingly today. So, so let us also claim our victories because we needed to embolden ourselves to go forward. So I want to say, let us reclaim that power. I think our panelists all have alluded to the need to assert accountability. That for me is the crucial missing piece. We've outsourced that. We've allowed the people we love and trusted and put into government to behave without accountability. I want to use a few simple things that we're not using. One, let us support the non-government organizations like Section 27, Equal Education, the Treatment Action Campaign, who have asserted in the face of a well-funded government pushback on many occasions, asserted the rights in our constitution. Let us support our non-government organizations. But our non-government organizations are empty shells. If we don't rebuild from the ground up in our communities, that notion that ultimately amounts to what was referred to as electoral accountability. How do people we vote into power disregard a constitutional court ruling that asserts the right? So the constitution hasn't failed. It's in fact, we allow those people whom the Constitutional Court had called out and instructed very explicitly sometimes to do certain things. We let them get away without having to implement it. How does that happen? On our watch. I also want to appeal to us to use things like Parliament. 
their parliamentary hearings. I've participated twice. And it's quite remarkable what you can achieve when you do that. Why do we not keep our parliamentarians more accountable? You look at local government. Each council is supposed to be convening ward committee meetings. They don't. How do they get away with it? Why are we not mobilizing our people to force our councillors to do that? There are many other ways in which we, this constitution has actually given us. Nedlack, how do trade union representatives get away with backing someone like Jacob Zuma? Hmm? How do they do that? Is it because our trade union members are not as active as what they used to be around the right kinds of issues. So my appeal tonight to all of us here, because we came here because we signed up to the project to try and get our country on the right path for the things that we've struggled for. Let us regroup and let us do just that. And assert what Justice Moseneke called, consistently called on for accountability in whatever spheres we are. So I want to thank you all for being here. On Monday, we are, we are celebrating Human Rights Day. Let us celebrate it. Let us, use it. let us use that time to, in fact, begin to reassert the power that brought us to where we are. And let us stop outsourcing our power. Because by and large, I think people say, there are many good men and women in parliament for whatever reason, they are not finding their voice through the electoral system or whatever. I think that's nonsense too. Because quite frankly, how does a president get away with doing bad things? If we use the system properly, anyway, I can go on and on. Let me, <laughs> don't get me going here. I am properly fired up about what's going on around the place. So let me conclude by thanking you, Adila, Dikhan, Tembeka, and every one of you have agreed to come here because people here, in fact, are here because of the work you are doing in a number of ways. And so to say a very simple thank you to our panelists, you know, there's, there's, we, we actually do say thank you sometimes. You Vanessa, or, um, uh, well, I think we're going to ask <laughs> Vanessa, uh, to, and I'm going to distance myself because I do think we must observe COVID protocols. Okay, thank you, Cheryl, for those um, encouraging words and for the appeals. And so um, I'm helping Cheryl to say thank you to the panelists and, and thank you to Luando who arranged, um, she had to leave because uh, there's, um, she needed to be with her family this evening. She just left 10 minutes ago. And um, something that um, we've been trying to do and we finally achieved in the Constitutional Trust is to print all the, or to print the preamble to the constitution, which you've seen sit between the two men in all the 11 languages, official languages. And we had the opportunity to ask Tembeka, may I call you by your first name, which one he would prefer. And he said the Isikosa version. So, I didn't get an opportunity to ask you, um, Justice Dekhar Moseneki, what is your preference? Setswana, please. <laughs> Isn't that nice, Adila? <laughs> and and, the, and I just wanted to take a moment since I have the podium back and I didn't do it at the start of the evening, is to thank all the organizations who facilitated the live stream. Thank you, Cheryl. Who facilitated the live stream of this conversation through YouTube channels and Facebook channels and Times Live and the Islam Radio and SAFM and ITV and uh, Channel 347. So thank you to everybody who participated and made it possible for us to share this conversation with many more people than just the 47 of us in this room. So thank you for your attention. And so thank you, Ahmed. Um, you can cut the live stream. And thank you to all the guests who watched us on live. <laughs>
26, the number of parties that sat down to carve out a democracy at the newly named multi-party negotiation. What had been blank sheets of paper were filled with new laws and the dream of freedom for all South Africans. But the sun was still not out. The communist leader, a hero of the liberation, was gunned down in his driveway one morning. An election date was set, utter relief. How would there be a free and fair election in a land of division? The right wing were intent on driving away peace. The gut-wrenched nation wept on a knife's edge, but the negotiators persevered. Even when some left the table, even when white separatists invaded the talks, in army gear, guns raised, the negotiators kept talking. A council of many parties was established to oversee the voting. Days and nights passed, days of deadlocks and nights of no deals, but the negotiators kept talking. At last, the interim constitution was signed. 34. The number of constitutional principles that were set out to guide the final constitution. The new parliament would draft the new document. The new constitutional court would weigh up if the principles were met. But still, the clouds stayed down. The IFP threatened to boycott the first democratic elections. At the 11th hour, they came back to the table. 27 April 1994, the day the nation will never forget. We woke up and made our mark. Our emancipation. Our brand new president, straight out of the box, Munchakata. <laughs> Loved the Archbishop when the prisoner was made president and the people won power after centuries of struggle. At last, the winds of change had blown away the clouds.